right, hello. Let's uh, read The Egyptian Cinderella by Shirley Climo, illustrated by Ruth Heller. Long ago in the land of Egypt, where the green Nile River ends to meet the blue sea, there lived a maiden called Rhodopis. When she was still a small child, Rhodopis had been stolen by pirates. She was snatched from her home in Greece, taken across the sea to Egypt, and there sold as a slave. Like the Egyptian servant girls, Rhodopis went to the water's edge each day to wash clothes or to gather the reeds that grew along the river bank. But poor Rhodopis looked different from the Egyptian girls. Their eyes were brown and hers were green. Their hair hung straight to their shoulders while the breeze blew hers into tangles. Their skin glowed like copper, but her skin burned red beneath the sun. That was how she got her name. For Rhodopis meant rosy cheeked in Greece. Rosy Rhodopis scoffed the servant girls, hissing her name between their teeth. Rhodopis pretended not to hear, but she blushed rosier than ever. Although her master was kind, he was old and liked to doze beneath the fig tree. He seldom heard the servant girls tease Rhodopis. He never saw them ordering her about. Hurry, Rhodopis, they would shout at her. The, the geese are in the garden, eating up the onions. Mend my rope. I'm hungry, Rhodopis. Take the bread. Rhodopis always hurried to do their bidding, for the Egyptian girls were household servants, and she was only a slave. Rhodopis found friends among the animals instead. Birds ate crumbs from her hands. She coaxed a monkey to sit upon her shoulder and charmed a hippopotamus with her songs. It would raise its huge head from the muddy water and prick its small ears to listen. Sometimes when her clothes, her chores were done and the day had cooled, Rhodopis would dance for her animal companions. She twirled so lightly that her tiny bare feet scarcely touched the ground. One evening her master wakened to see her dance. No goddess is more nimble, he called out. Such a gift deserved reward. He tugged his chin whiskers, thinking, and then declared, You shall go barefoot no longer. Her master ordered a pair of dainty slippers made especially for Rhodopis. The soles were made of real leather, and the toes were gilded with rose-red gold. Now when Rhodopis danced, her feet sparkled like fireflies. The rose-red slippers sent Rhodopis more more apart ever. The Egyptian servant girls were jealous, for they wore clumsy sandals woven from papyrus. Out of spite, they found new tasks to do, keeping Rhodopis so busy that she was too tired to dance at night. One evening, Kippa, who was chief among the servant girls, announced, Tomorrow we set sail for Memphis to see the pharaoh. His majesty is going to hold court for all subjects. There will be musicians and dancing, said another servant girl, eyeing the rose-lipped slippers. There will be feasts, added a third. Poor Rhodopis, you must stay behind, Kippa jeered. You have linen to wash and grain to grind and the garden to feed. The next morning, just as Ra, as Ra, the sun, was climbing into the sky, Rhodopis followed the servant girls to the riverbank. Kippa wore a necklace of blue beads, bracelet jingled on the wrist of the second, the third had tied a many-colored sash about her waist, although Rhodop wore a plain tunic, on her feet were the red, rose-red slippers. Perhaps they will let me come along to see the pharaoh after all, she thought. But the three servant girls pulled their raft around the bend, pulled their raft around the bend in the river without giving Rhodopis a backwards glance. Rhodopis sighed and turned to the basket piled high with dirty clothes. Wash the linen, weed the garden, grind the grain. She slapped the wooden paddle against the cloth in time to her song. The hippopotamus, tired of so dull a tune, pushed out of the reeds and splashed into the river. Shame, cried Rhodopis, shaking her paddle. You splattered mud on my beautiful slippers. She polished the shoes on the hem of her tunic until the rosy gold glittered in the sun. Then she carefully put them on the bank behind her. Wash the linen, weed the garden. Rhodopis began again when suddenly shadow fell on the water. Rhodopis jumped up. A great falcon, the symbol of the god Horus, circled in the sky with wings spread so wide that they blotted out the sun. Greetings to you, proud Horus, Rhodopis murmured, shut her head, and felt a rush of air on the back of her neck. When Rhodopis dared to lift her eyes, she saw the falcon soar away. 
dangling from his talons was one of her beautiful slippers. Stop, she pleaded, come back. But the bird did not heed her. He flew toward the sun until he was no more than a dark speck against the gold. Rodopis bit her tongue. One, she was worse than none at all. Now she'd have to dance like a stork, hopping about on one foot, and even the monkey would laugh. Rodopis tucked the slipper into her tunic and returned to her laundry, salting the river with her tears. After Rodopis had lost sight of the falcon, the mighty bird followed the course of the Nile to the city of Memphis, to the square where the pharaoh was holding court. There the falcon watched and waited. The pharaoh's name was Amasis. On his head he wore the red and white crown of the two Egypts. The double crown was heavy and pinched his ears. He preferred driving his chariot fast as the wind to sitting on the throne. Amasis yawned. At that very moment, the falcon dropped the rose red slipper into his lap. The slipper was so bright that Amasis thought it was a scrap of the sun. Then he saw the falcon wheeling overhead. The god Horus sends me a sign, exclaimed the pharaoh. He picked up the rose red slipper. Every maiden in Egypt must try the dew. She whose foot it fits shall be my queen. That is the will of the gods. Amasis dismissed the court, called for his chariot, and began his search at once. When the Egyptian servant girls arrived to Memphis, they found the throne empty and the streets deserted. They were so angry on their return that even seeing Rhodopis with her rose red slipper did not please them. Slaves are better off barefoot, snap. Kippa. The pharaoh journeyed to distant cities. He tracked the desert where amidst tower over the sand, and he climbed the steep cliffs where falcons nest. The rose red slipper was always in his hand. Wherever he went, women and girls, rich or poor, flocked to try on the slipper, but none could fit into it so small a shoe. The longer Amasa searched, the more determined he became to marry the maiden who had lost the tiny slipper. He summoned his royal barge and vowed to visit every land along the Nile. The barge was hung with sails of silk. Trumpets blared and oarsmen rowed to the beat of the gongs. The din was so dreadful when the barge rounded the bend in the river, Rhodopis fled in alarm. But the servant girls ran to the water's edge. Now we will see the pharaoh, cried Kippa. Amasis held up the rose red slipper. Whoever can wear the shoe shall be my queen. The servant girls knew that shoe and knew its owner too. Yet they clapped their hands over their mouths and said nothing. If one of them could wear it, for Kippa. Then the others tried to put on the slipper. Each cramped her foot and curled her toes and squeezed and tears ran down her cheeks. Still her heel hung over. Enough, said Amasis wearily. He would have set sail again had he not chanced to see Rhodopis peering through the rushes. Come, he commanded. You must try this rose red slipper. The servant girls gawked open mouthed as the pharaoh kneeled before Rhodopis. He slipped the tiny shoe on her foot with ease. Then Rhodopis pulled its mate from the folds of her tunic. Behold, cried Amasis, in all this land there is none so fit to be queen. But Rhodopis is a slave, protested one of the servant girls. Kippa sniffed. She's not even Egyptian. She is the most Egyptian of all, the pharaoh declared, for her eyes are as green as the Nile, her hair as feathery as papyrus, and her skin the pink of a lotus flower. The pharaoh led Rhodopis to the royal barge, and with every step, her rose-red slippers winked and sparkled in the sun. And that's the end. All right, well, once again, the shoes really helped. All right, thank you for reading The Egyptian Cinderella.